Mr. Samarjeeva, thank you very much for joining us on this call. Uh, I want to start off with asking you about something, a topic that has been very much in, uh, in conversation, especially on social media recently, and that is this new 15th drone regiment of the Sri Lanka Army slash the use of helicopters to sort of surveil uh, with the, uh, on people to see if they are abiding by quarantine laws while we are under lockdown or curfew. Now, if you were to comment just on the technological aspect on it, of it, do you think that using technology like drones to uh, monitor and surveil people is a bit of an overreach on the side, uh, on the part of the government? Well, you see, whenever there's a new technology coming in, uh, we ascribe all kinds of good effects and ill effects to the new technology uh, without really comparing it with what was going on before. And I generally try to look at what we have and look at what's coming, what has been introduced. So if you really look at the question of say, enforcing a lockdown or a stay at home order, the old way would be that, you know, if you go leave the gates, you come onto the roads or public property, uh, you, you always ran the danger of being observed and being reported. So in a situation like a pandemic, uh, we could also have a situation not by the officials, the police observing you directly, but you could also have a situation where the people around you who believe that this order is legitimate and necessary for public health could observe this and make phone calls and report you. So that is the old method, right? Now, as you, as many of many people have seen from movies and so on, uh, you know, this, this has been done now through technology in many countries. So the United Kingdom, for example, has got the largest number of CCTV cameras in public places in the world. Uh, Los Angeles, for everybody who's seen the movies, is quite famous for using helicopters with spotlights to hunt down various people running away, uh, hiding, and so on and so forth, right? So what you're seeing with the drones is a kind of a, the next step of something that has been going on in the world for some time. Uh, does it mean that it's a good thing? Does it mean it's a bad thing? I would say that if there are quarantine laws uh, which are properly implemented based on scientific advice, I don't think people should be breaking quarantine regulations. And one way in which you can make sure is to get a large majority of people to willingly obey them. The other is that there'll be a small minority who could be doing damage, who simply won't obey the rules. And there must be some kind of sanctions against them. Now, how do you do this in an economical way, in an efficient way, is the question. So my sense is that there's you know, nothing extraordinarily unique about drones, except for the fact that as we keep going, it gets more and more intrusive. And there's another thing, which is a drone is not that picture that you see. Behind that picture is a, is a very significant computational capability, visual analytics software, and storage capacity. So in the old days, now for example, even in Sri Lanka, we have CCTV cameras. If you go to Borella Junction or down Rajagiri, you'll see CCTV at the intersections. You drive to Katnaika, you don't believe how many times your photograph will be collected by the government when you go to the airport because that whole stretch is completely equipped with cameras. Now, the issue is that in many of these cases, there's some human being who's just looking at the picture. And the whole thing is erased after two days or whatever, simply because they don't have enough capacity. And if there is a crime, what they do is they quickly say, okay, now preserve that. So that one is not erased, they keep it, and the rest of it is erased. Now, with the drone technology, that doesn't happen. The thing is designed for visual analytics because a drone 
technology brings an enormous amount of information in which cannot be processed by normal human beings staring at a camera, at a, at a screen. So what happens is that as it comes in, it's stored, one, and two, it's processed by visual analytics software. And this could include, I don't know what kind of software they're using. This could even include uh, facial recognition like in China and various other places. So now you get a sort of almost a qualitative jump in the sophistication of the observation by the state of its citizens. Now, the question is, again, if I were to sort of stay with basic principles, I would say that, you know, we should allow these things to be done, but we should allow it to be done by the police or by the people who are, who are authorized under the quarantine laws, which in my opinion, have to be updated. Uh, they are from the 19th century, I believe. Uh, and uh, Mr. Subandiran has brought a new law that will allow it to be updated. But, you know, come to that. It should be done by people who are trained in police techniques, who have a police mindset or a public health mindset, not by the military, because the military is supposed to be defending us against external enemies and not, not doing things inside the country. In many countries, there are constitutional prohibitions against the military engaging in police type activities. So to me, it sort of, I don't know what's the word I should use. It puzzles me, it uh, worries me that the Sri Lankan army has decided to create a drone regiment because drones, are in a military context are extremely lethal equipment and they are used against tanks and vehicles. So actually this is an interesting time that in this month of November, the entire military science, military strategy is being rewritten as a result of the Nagorno-Karabakh war where Turkish and Israeli drones completely defeated the overwhelming um, tank superiority of the Armenian army. And now basically people are saying that the tanks will be history, that nobody's going to use tanks anymore and wars will be fought using drones. Now, remember these drones and our drones are different. Our drones take pictures. Those drones actually kill people. They drop bombs. They're low cost unmanned aircraft. So, it, it, it sort of puzzles me because in a country like ours, an island, what we should be doing is focusing our military uh, efforts and resources on the Air Force and the uh, Navy and the Coast Guard rather than on the Army. Uh, but here we have not only the Army getting the bulk of the resources, but also the Army getting a drone regiment to be used against whom? Uh, I, I, I am a little worried and confused about that. Okay, so if I were to unpack that a little bit, one of the key, the first key concern that you raised was that of intrusion. And I think that brings you to the question of public versus private. So when you were talking about violating quarantine laws and these laws being placed so that people don't step out of their houses and, and perhaps move into public places, and that is where perhaps the drone capabilities can be used to ensure that these laws are not being violated. It is when the when drone capabilities are used to, to sort of intrude into private capacity or private spaces that there is actually a breach of uh, privacy and an intrusion. Do you think the authorities, and in this, in this case, I'm talking specifically of the army, of course, the military, uh, and even people are aware of this public versus private thing, or do you think because we come from uh, let's say even in, even in the last 40 to 50 years, uh, a sort of culture of being uh, used to a civil war, being used to having military around, that most people would just run and hide or just be afraid or just feel that they have uh, no rights because they are unaware of this public versus private divide or uh, that, they should be knowing, th that they should know about. In some of the earliest cases that we had with uh, aircraft, uh, satellite remote sensing and so on, is that you couldn't keep this public-private separation. 
people who were bathing nude in their swimming pools in California were being photographed because the, the, the technology simply is incapable of differentiating, oh, that's private, that's public. It's not capable of differentiating between that. But even otherwise, you see what I, I, I think that's an important factor we should think about. But in beyond that, what I said is that in the old one, it had no, it didn't have extensive uh, processing and storage capabilities. So just to give an example, in the old days, darkness was an important screen, important tool that people who wanted to behave surreptitiously used. Darkness is no defense against a drone because they can take, you know, they can use the other parts of the, the spectrum, uh, infrared and so on and take pictures. They can tell there's a warm breathing human being down there, uh, even if they can't identify the face. So, uh, and then what I said is these are stored and you apply visual analytics on it and you can do things like facial recognition and so on. So you can do a whole lot more with these new technologies than you could do with the old ones. And that is something I, I think people are unaware of. And people, in my opinion, should be aware of, at least so that they could know what they're giving consent to, or they're not objecting to. Right. Now, is this, if this is what you refer to as big data, what do you think needs to be done? Like, for instance, I know that we don't have very uh, solid uh, data protection law. Do you think uh, organizations and entities and people like yourself who are working in this area with technology and big data and not necessarily looking at big data as a bad thing, but looking at how, what protections can be put in place to ensure things like, for instance, all the footage and uh, that is being taken by these drones are not used for purposes that they should not have been not be used for without consent uh, and things like that. Do you think the critical moment is now seeing that the, the authorities are moving so fast with the technology? Uh, I happened to be the chairman of the ICT agency until December of last year. And during that period, uh, the ministry, which has the responsibility for legislation and policy actually formulated uh, a data protection bill which was drafted by the legal draftsman and so on. I, I personally felt, and I put it on record that there were certain shortcomings in the bill, but uh, it was there and it couldn't get, I think, I couldn't, it couldn't get on the order paper for cabinet or for parliament, one of the two. So uh, if the government wants to uh, enact data protection law, um, I mean, Raw, the, much of the work has been done. They can take it, make some modifications and get it done. Uh, I, however, do not believe that, you know, laws by themselves will solve all our problems. I think awareness is needed. Uh, I think uh, laws by necessity have to be relatively broad and abstract. So, uh, once you bring it down to, to actual cases, uh, what is, for example, what is personal and how can consent be given? Now, I think the consent model of safeguarding privacy is more or less broken right now all over the world, but at least the model says that if information that has my likeness is capable of identifying me, has my address, my NIC number, et cetera, that belongs to me. And I have to explicitly give condition consent unless in particular exceptional circumstances that are set out in the law. So how can this be actually implemented by some device that is going over my roof and is doing something else, but also taking a picture of my face and of my, my the top of my house, uh, those have to be worked out. So data protection law, even if it is there, will not by itself solve the problem. You have to make more specific regulations under it to govern this particular phenomenon. Now, big data or data analytics is 
described as you know taking a lot of computer analyzable data, uh, not necessarily in structured form, not necessarily in nicely organized into Excel sheets or something like that, uh, but sort of using uh, new software and uh, powerful computers to deal with millions and millions of records and pull out patterns from them. So for example, some very interesting work has just come out. It's not even refereed yet about uh, people's mobility as measured by how their mobile phones move or their smartphone data that is being collected, but without personally identifiable information, just masses of people going to golf face versus going to the, the green area outside parliament. And what are the implications for the spread of COVID-19? These kinds of research are being done. And in my opinion, they, they are very useful and they can help us to manage the pandemic. Uh, so that is a good side of it. The bad side of it is of course, uh, you know, if you can go down to identifying people and if there aren't enough safeguards, you could have situations where people who are engaging in political protest can be identified and, uh, you know, as we know, ministers, various important people, uh, you know, they, they, they go on certain journeys that they don't want the world to know about, or even ordinary people have certain secret journeys that they, they, they engage in. And these things may be traceable and documentable uh, using data analytics and the records that are generated by your Facebook or your credit card use or your mobile phone use and things like that. So those are things that we need to have uh, ethical guidelines within companies that collect them, uh, how long they should be kept and things like that. And, uh, you know, various safeguards about pseudonymization, de-anonymization and so on. We've been working for quite a bit of time on, on this. And now, of course, with the with the machine uh, machine language machine learning, which is what I was saying about, which is you really don't have to write the equations and say, can you identify this or that? You can just train the software on large amounts of data, and then have it come up with some answers. And we don't know how it came up with answers. That's called machine learning, or even more colloquially, artificial intelligence. So the ethics issues around that and so on are being researched at this moment by many people, including my organization. So you could say these issues are uh, in any case being argued and defined even globally, not necessarily uh, that this is an issue that has a local context only. Uh, given that we are in a pandemic, which has necessitated perhaps uh, not just the use of drones and technology, but also things like, for instance, uh, the quarantine law, uh, which you were referring to as well, it's the quarantine audience ordinance from the 1900s, uh, which was recently updated uh, to allow curfew, there's an amendment to it, uh, to allow for um, a manner of curfew, not really curfew, because curfew itself is only allowed under certain sections of it. So uh, a question that we came across even at that point is, isn't it the time now perhaps more, more isn't it perhaps more important now than ever before, that we at this time perhaps sit down and create an ethical framework for these things because, especially because there's no real vaccine or anything for COVID right at the moment, especially not coming into Sri Lanka, even if it were to be a global a solution available globally first. Uh, going into next year, we're still expecting to be under lockdown for large periods on and off. Uh, this is not something that needs people to get on the streets for, do you think? right now would be a good time for people to actually start talking about this. Absolutely. I mean, the ethical issues, I think we need to talk about because by definition, ethics have to be followed, implemented, but not necessarily enforced by the police or the courts. So when it comes to enforcement, you have laws and regulations. But as I said, the, the, the area is such that 
most probably ethics will have a bigger impact than law. Uh, because for example, you know, uh, some of these algorithms uh, would be difficult for our courts to understand, let alone enforce. Uh, the Australians are supposed to be trying to get companies to submit their algorithms to see whether they are fair, reliable, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you know, I don't think the Australian bureaucracy is uh, that well paid or that very clever. So I don't think they'll be able to do it. And for sure, our state machinery isn't capable of doing things like that. Uh, you could say, you know, I mean, at an early stage of technological development, uh, too rigid, uh, laws being too rigid can stifle that development. So just to give one example, one of my uh, levels of discomfort uh, with the data protection bill is that there is a clause there which says that uh, irreversibly anonymized, irreversibly anonymized. So you see, you can take information that pertains to, to you, your movie watching habits, uh, and, you know, I mean, actually, you can say something about a person by looking to see what movies they watch at what time and so on and so forth. Now, uh, Netflix provided some of this information to people almost on a day and said, you know, if you do such and such, such and such, and give us an algorithm to, to predict what other movies you are likely to, to prefer, will give you a price. And some people took this big data dump and they reverse engineered it. And they said, that is the Boston mayor's movie watching habits. That is the Senator for Massachusetts and his movie viewing ha habits. They, they, they took what was covered up, what was anonymized and they reverse engineered it, combined it with other data sets and they de-identified, they de-anonymized. So those kinds of things are there because I, in my view, you see science is like that. You, it's a moving target. So to have a word like irreversibly anonymized is extraordinarily high bar. So once you go that far, it's possible that you could be killing all AI research in Sri Lanka. And you may have to, you know, you may be seeding the ground for artificial intelligence research and machine learning to China. Like uh, generally European laws are very tight in this area. And as a result, all the innovation is happening in the United States and in China. And we have a chance, but are we also going to shut that off for ourselves? These are things people have got to, to, to discuss and then decide on because it's possible that, you know, we say, oh, our privacy is so important that we don't care if we, we become laggards and camp followers in artificial intelligence. We really don't want to be at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. That's, that's a decision a society can take. I'm just saying that given our circumstances, we should at least think about it before doing it. Um, well, I really hope Mr. Samarajiva, voices like yours will continue to be strident and loud. And if you feel that you have not been loud enough uh, all this while, maybe this is the moment to start speaking about these things publicly. Uh, and I hope that uh, at this point, at least an ethical framework, if not even the bill uh, will be picked up uh, by people watching and people able to make a change in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you.